Uh, Randall Chambly, Golf Channel analyst, joining us on the program. What do you think of that logic there? We have a keg, White Castle, and uh, I take my chances. You just made me hungry. Who doesn't like White <laughs> Castle? I mean, normally I, I've I've had them at two thirty in the morning. I've actually never had them at dinner time, so I, I assume they're pretty darn good then too. I don't think anybody's ever had White Castles before like ten o'clock at night. It always feels like right. You know, right. They, I can remember. <laughs> I can remember having. Bacon cheeseburgers at two thirty in college from Jack in the Box. Never eaten it since, <laughs> but it was the best damn meal I ever had in my life. And I mean, I'm probably just like two thousand calories in the thing, but man, when they were good. Anybody ever have any strange eating habits on the course when you played? What they had in their bag? Well, there used to be a, a, a fellow that well, uh, you know, you know who Mark Lai is. He yeah. still he still does radio or whatever. But you know, he uh, he was a diabetic, so. He had to eat constantly when when he played, and this was back before there were power bars or anything like that. So he would have you know all kinds of things wrapped up in tin foil, and he'd be unwrapping them pretty much every <laughs> hole. So you'd have to just back away and go, you know, what what are you doing? I mean, it's just like an all day buffet trot, you know. Um, that was about it. I can't remember any odd eating habits on the golf course. But there are guys who snuck in liquor when they played. Oh, I, I, I know a few players that uh, that had, you know, they, they were all always had a Coke can with them. And, the, you know, there were I know I know a few players that, that won, uh, you know, probably past the legal limit. Um, you know, they could play pretty good. They were they were like you. You know, you said you could handle your beer. They, they, I know a few players that could handle theirs. But is this to calm your nerves? Well, one one player in particular who's an absolute legend. Um he was in, I'm not going to name him, but he was in a playoff once with Jack Nicholas and, and he ducked into the bathroom. Okay. And two or three times during this playoff. And, and then, you know, he, he you know, they finally played on and, and I believe John, well, there you go. I, snuck <laughs> <it>. <laughs> I didn't say, and, and look, it's not the last name you think. Okay. So uh, he, he prevailed. Boy, you can and keep a secret, Randall. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's so bad, isn't it? I forgot. Nobody else is listening, right? No, 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 right? no. We're not, even, we're not even back on the uh, air right now. Right, that's what I thought. Yeah. We're always meant to act like we're just sitting around yeah. talking, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we welcome you back to the Dan Patrick Show. No, 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 don't do that. So, so anyway, <laughs> afterwards, Jax went up to, you know, the guy who's one buddy, right? And he said, I'm worried that he's, he, he's, that he's drinking. And my buddy, you know, my, he started laughing. He was like, Jack. He never stopped drinking. <laughs> <laughs> wow! But he was a terrific fella and a hell of a player. And uh, yeah, he had a few pops from time to time. All right, the uh, Bryson DeChambeau bet that I have: you can either take him to win, or he misses the cut. But <laughs> the you you get your straight up bet. Let's say you put a thousand dollars on it to win. You get ten thousand if he misses the cut. Which one would you take? Oh, I'd go for the win. I, I don't. I, I can't. I can't even come up with any scenario where he's he's not a factor in this event. You know, um, if he drives it any semblance like he did at the U.S. Open, and by all accounts, he's 20, 30 yards longer than he was then, which is preposterous. Um, you know, he's going to be chipping to so many of these greens. Yeah. He's going to be hitting wedges to the par fives, and he's a much, much better putter than he was. You know, last year at this time, he's tenth. He was tenth. He was tenth in twenty twenty in, in strokes game putting with that length. So I, I'd go for the win. I, I don't see anybody getting that ten thousand dollars, Dan. Do you think it's his to lose? Uh, yes, actually, I, I, that's a good question. Um, yes, I, I do. You know, did you hear Tiger yesterday in the media center? He said Tiger said of Bryson that he's doing things that nobody has ever done in the history of the game. I mean, that that would be like. That'd be like Shakespeare saying another writer could really turn a phrase. <laughs> <laughs> but what it, what's the downside? Any downside to Bryson DeChambeau, this style, this philosophy? Well, I, I would have said, you know, he's, he's, he, he likes to swing in to out on it. And I would have said, historically, players who swing in to out have trouble off of the side hill lies. At Augusta National. So the great players are cutting it off those sort of hook lies. They're picking it and cutting it, getting it up in the air. But, like, but like Bryson, Nicholas. yeah, like, like Jack and Tiger and, and even, you know, Jordan Spieth is the perfect example. And, and Justin Thomas is the perfect example of somebody who could do that. But Bryson, 
hits it past all those spots where that would be an issue, like miles past it. Like he, he could hit it 30, 40 yards past Dustin Johnson and Brooks Kepka. Like it's, I've never seen anything like that. But how do you explain that? Because every weekend golfer is swinging out of their shoes now, Randall. Yeah. How do you get length? And then how do you add even more length to it when you're a professional? Yeah. The thing is, there was there was so much room for added distance in this game. You think about it. I've made this analogy, but years ago, you know, you tune in, you watch Nolan Ryan. And, you know, they were, they were kind of guessing, but they're like, he's throwing at 105 miles an hour. And you could assume that nobody else in the, in the world could throw a baseball harder than that. But you tune into a golf tournament, you see Tiger Woods hitting a shot, and he's swinging 124 miles an hour. Well, there are scores of people that could swing way faster than that. Scores in the game, long drive guys. What Bryson did was he studied the long drive guys, and he tapped into their movements, okay, because there was clearly room to swing the club 20 miles an hour faster amongst the best professional golfers. But, the, but everybody dismissed the long drive guys as freaks or they couldn't play golf. But what Bryson did was he watched the long drive guys really studied it from a biomechanic standpoint, their movements and incorporated those movements. But then and this was the coup de gras, really. He added elements of the straightest hitters of all time because they do very specific things just like long drive guys do. And then he meshed those two and that's the Holy grail. And that's why, you know, normally, when, when guys get paired with Tiger or Phil, you see them walking down the fairway and they're always turned looking at Tiger or Phil and Tiger or Phil are never looking at them and they're just kind of walking ahead. When you see Tiger or Phil get paired with Bryson, Bryson's walking down the fairway, Tiger and Phil are turned looking at Bryson and trying to soak up everything that this guy knows because clearly he's tapped into something that nobody else has tapped into in the game of golf, professional game of golf. I'm wondering though, Bryson, you know how... Augusta, the Masters, they control everything. Do they get to the point where they say, you have to have a golf ball that is to our specifications <laughs> to play this course? I just worry about courses becoming antiquated because of, you know, equipment, the golf yeah. ball. You know, the golfer, I understand, but the equipment and, and the golf ball is changing the sport. Could you see the Masters in five years from now when – how many golfers are going to try to incorporate what Bryson DeChambeau is doing, whether they do it correctly or not. And you know, those par fives, some of those aren't meant to be had in two, or at least you don't have a wedge in there. And that's, what's going to happen here. Listen, not five years, five months from now, they might be playing <laughs> gutta, gutta percha and hickories when, the, when they come back. Yeah. Because I mean, what Bryson is on the cusp of doing this week, what he could very well do, is and and I've argued against people who say that the ball should be rolled back because you know the same things still matter in the game strategy long drive I mean long irons all those things yeah but what Bryson could do was literally obliterate the integrity of this design I mean drive and chip to greens and drive wedges to par fives I've never thought the argument was really on that sort of solid foundation until Bryson came along. So what are you going to do if you, if you run this event? And obviously the USGA and, and the RNA governing bodies, they have many, many different factors to consider, but the masters is in a position where they can just unilaterally say, okay, we're going to have a tournament ball. Yeah. And scale things back a bit. Yeah. But then, you know, the, the, if you scale it back to where Bryson is the one who is, is struggling to get on these par fives and two, Nobody else in the game could get on these par fives and two, like nobody else. So then it's not very interesting. So it's, it's, what do you do? You know, how, how do you, how do you combat this where the, the, the golf is still compelling? Because right now I think we can all agree. The masters is a pretty good history of producing compelling events with the formula they have. We're talking to Bryson, uh, Bryson, Brandel Chambly, <laughs> golf champ. You wish I was saying Bryson to I really, really do. <laughs> How far would he outdrive you at your best uh, when you were he playing? He would outdrive me by a hundred yards. You know, if I pop one now, if I really pop one, I might get it two ninety, but more. You know, right around there. He's gonna hit. He's hit, he carried it three sixty two the other day. It's, uh, on the range. One swing, carried at 362. That's going to roll 400. I know. That's why I said uh, to start the show, he'll hit drives of 400 yards at Augusta. And now, I know it's a little wet there, conditions. Uh, yeah. But um, how's it going to look and sound tomorrow? 
you know, if you, you can probably find it online if you haven't already seen it, but you can find him hitting this shot uh, two days ago on the range. And it, I mean, it sounded like a cannon. It really did. <laughs> I mean, it really did. I, I replayed it, you know, I don't even know. I probably watched it like 50 times. And I, I couldn't believe the sound of it. And, you know, he backed away and you could hear the person videotaping it saying, was that 200? What, meaning the ball speed was at 200. He has a machine there that measures it instantly. And he was like, oh, yeah, 201. And I, I mean, it, it, it doesn't it, – like I can remember – I honestly, I can remember hitting balls next to Tiger Woods at the 2000 U.S. Open. Tiger played all right in that event. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Now, on Tuesday, I'm hitting balls next to him. He's right behind me hitting balls. And I'm grinding away. You know, I'm not paying attention to Tiger. I, you know, I'm dumb enough to think, I, you know, I can – got a chance or whatever my buddy is there watching me and he says hey stop hey and i said what he goes if you don't turn around and watch what's happening behind you you will have missed the greatest show ever this is tuesday so i turn around and i watch him you know and the sound of it right and and the flight of it and the the power and the grace you know i just never heard anything like that and i watched him for like 20 30 minutes completely forgot what i was doing then he walked away and then the next shot I hit, I swear it sounded like I hit a wiffle ball. And it, and it looked like I hit a wiffle ball. And I was like, he just, I'm, I feel impotent. You know, it's like, what am I even, what am I even doing? What, why did I watch that? I don't, that's like following, you know, I remember reading once where Billy Crystal said he thought he was a really funny guy. And he got invited to go to this gig, right? He was slaying it everywhere. And he's standing in the wings and he's listening to this guy on the stage. And he's like, This is the funniest human being I've ever heard. I suck. I am not funny. That guy's funny. And he had to follow Robin Williams. And he was like, you know, what are you going to do? And he's like, I watched Tiger. And I thought, we're not even playing the same game. I think he beat me by 35 shots that week. Tiger's chances this week are what? Not great. You know, top 10, top 15. Hey, listen, I've learned on your show to never say never, okay? <laughs> that is, <laughs> you, you did learn the hard way. Yeah. He, Tiger just did that to me. Yes, right? he did. I mean, uh, and, and it was great to see. I did occasionally, I don't know if I did on your show, add the caveat that I hope I'm wrong. And if anybody could prove me wrong, it was Tiger. And he certainly did. Uh, you know, the Masters has a way of, of providing Hail Marys to great stars. You know, Jack had one. Ben Crenshaw had maybe the greatest Hail Mary I've ever seen in, in golf. Um, Tiger had a bit of a one last year, but he was playing fine golf coming in here. So you could kind of sense it. Uh, he's hitting it. You know, he's, he's the last time he was out, Dan, at Zozo at Sherwood, uh, his club head speed had dropped to 113 miles an hour. That's tour average. Mm. And, and he's not really picked up any accuracy to sort of offset that decay in his club head speed. So, you know, again, there's, I don't know, you'd know this. So like great athletes, it's really hard to point at the part where they are not physically capable of doing what they're eminently capable of doing mentally. And it's tiger's not there yet, but you know, it happens like incrementally. And, you know, he's, he's lost a little club head speed from last year. He still had pop last year. You know, he drove it past Finau last year on the 17th hole coming in, and, and it surprised Tiger. And afterwards, he said, you know, I, I ramped up my club head speed. So maybe that adrenaline rush happens this week, but he's going to need that club head speed as wet as it is. Do you think last year's Masters was the last one for Tiger? <laughs> I am not going to say that, Dan. <laughs> I, I'm not as dumb as you think I am, Dan. I mean, I'm close. I'm really close, but I'm not that dumb. Uh, uh He's at 82. He's going to get another one. Great to talk to you. We'll be watching. Uh, love uh, live from the Masters. Tell uh, Rich and company that we said hello, and uh, thanks for joining us again, Randall. I'll do it. And don't share our secret that we're talking no, about. The no, guy drinking, okay? no. All right, nobody. that's just between you and me. Yes, indeed. Talk to you later. Randall's on site at Augusta National this week, contributing to the Network's Golf Central Live from the Masters coverage throughout the week. The great Rich Lerner is your host. Coverage can be seen prior Two, and immediately following live tournament coverage Thursday through Sunday.